I'm going to give a presentation on something. I actually presented a similar um, a similar presentation for uh, a wireless conference in Toronto uh, a year or two back, and uh, with the explosion of kind of everything connected kind of world, um, there's a lot of things that pop up in the in, in in the security practitioner world that we need to think about. Um, so during the presentation, I think if if people have a, a question they want to throw in the chat window. I'd be happy to take that, and uh, if not, maybe come off mute and just interrupt me. How long do we have? We oh, have an hour would be good. Yep, about an hour. So I'll probably get through this in about 40 minutes or so, and uh, certainly wide open to take questions at the end of the day. Some of these things are kind of conceptual slides that we can talk through as we go through. And feel free, anybody in the room here, to raise your hand. I think probably did you guys hear everybody talking on the computer when they're yeah so i think we've got okay for audio so so without further ado let's go on to the first chapter uh or the first uh, slide maybe there we go uh i don't need to spend a lot of time on me i'm old been around for a few years uh i'm an engineer by trade i've uh, worked a lot in telecom and infrastructure and security and things like that so I work for a company called Movia Technology right now, and we do uh, quite a lot of infrastructure work and security work right across the, the country um, and into the US and some work in Europe on uh, securing telecommunication networks and building out cloud infrastructure. Um, I also spend a fair amount of time, and we'll get this in the slide, with kind of the new way to build applications. Um, IoT and collecting of this data, and everybody's heard the buzzwords of analytics and big data and, you know, machine learning. Well, a lot of times there's lots and lots of activity around how we collect and capture this data and how we analyze it. So, interestingly enough, these new business models breed new types of applications. And in the old days when we were on mainframes and everything was fairly restricted and controlled, uh, we had a lot more handle on how to secure things. In today's world, you know, these applications are getting built sometimes in a weekend with a, with a pizza, maybe a case of beer, and a lot of times we're not thinking through the security models behind the scenes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight, and um, you know, feel free to kind of reach out. So the good old uh, the good old three circles, right? You can have you can have good, fast, or cheap, but you only get two of those. So you pick. You can have uh, you can have fast and cheap, but it's not going to be secure. You can have fast and secure, but it's probably not going to be cheap. And you can have security and cheap, but it's probably not going to be fast. So, you know, that's the uh, and of course there's exceptions to every rule, but uh, and a, and a little joke saying 70 percent of time we'll always get it right. So. Um, <clears throat> Just to frame and, and keep in mind, I don't want to insult the audience here. We're all security interested or security practitioners, but you know, just to frame in this, this presentation is meant for more of a general audience and people need to understand that security is different than privacy. And there are really large impacts on privacy when it comes down to how this data gets collected. And uh, there's lots and lots of examples where lot, you know, we pull in data from smart home technologies and the data by itself doesn't mean much but when we correlate it with other activities it starts to mean a lot about you know people's lives and that becomes a privacy issue so security is really the mechanisms behind how we protect data and secure communications privacy is it is a contextual conversation and in, in other words what kind of data is it where does it sit and how are you using it right so some examples of security would be you know firewalls and intrusion prevention virtual private networks and you know corporate encryption kind of technologies privacy is where does this data sit what kind of data is it and how does it get accessed does that make sense to everybody So private data is uh, a gray area and, and, and it takes some interpretation and maybe some common sense. Um, we have privacy laws in Canada. I mean, every country has their own set of privacy laws. And in fact, you know, there's privacy laws that get driven right down to the provincial level. And, uh, you know, anything that can uniquely identify an individual falls generally under the Privacy Act. And then the question is, is to which degree does it need to be protected? And 
this data can be either direct or indirect. And what that means is you may have private data on an individual. Your responsibility doesn't stop with you. If you share that data with a third party, you have to make sure that they're as good as stewards with the data as you are. So it doesn't, your liability and your responsibility doesn't stop with you, right? Um, if it's declared to be private data, um, you, you generally require explicit consent from the end user for that data to be used for the intended purpose. In other words, the, data, the, the user gives permission to share your health record in a particular context. You can't share that data in any other means than, than it's been uh, intended, right? And, you know, people have becoming, and this is a really interesting one, and we see it more and more every day, is in general terms, people will give away their privacy uh, for convenience. So, you know, you flip, you download a new app from the app store and how many people just say, yes, 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 yes. Well, guess what? Your phone's tracked everywhere you go and somebody's got that data. They know how long you've been, you know, at the massage club or at the bar or massage. at the, yeah. <laughs> at the, uh, you know, wherever you are, that data is being tracked. And, and uh, we have, you know, interestingly enough at this conference, I think it was last year or the year before, there are massive, massive geolocation databases with information about our phones, which are linked back to us in, as individuals. And that data doesn't come just from your phone. It comes from public Wi-Fi hotspots. It comes from mobile cellular networks. So the fact you turn data location off, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't know where this phone is, right? And... Uh, just because people have you know, become accustomed to giving it away doesn't mean that corporations don't have a legal obligation to protect it. And all that means, it means exactly what it says, right? So the fact you give it to somebody doesn't mean that somebody has the legal right to give it away. Uh, this is probably not, oh, it's better to, I can read it better off the screen than I can my own. So, um, you know, what does big data mean? And And here's a really interesting, uh, observation I've had um, when businesses get in the in the business of collecting large data sets from large populations of user groups um, you have to be very very careful on the reason that you collect that data because you can have unintended consequences where you take two data sets on their own and they don't necessarily identify a unique individual. You put them together and it does, right? And all of a sudden you've got a big problem on your hands because you've got private data and you fall under a piece of legislation that you didn't know you did. Those two data sets came with, without that capability, right? So those of us in this business, you have to be conscious of that and we have to coach our peers on how to deal with situations like that. And it can happen halfway through an application deployment. You know, you set up, oh, we think that we fall under a particular privacy jurisdiction, and all of a sudden we get access to a new data source, and all of a sudden we've changed the mandate of this particular application, and it has a big consequence on how we protect it, right? So, you know, things like location information and personal details and the data that we, that we collect. And then the last part, or the third point here, is we create private data. And a good example of this is um, I do some work with a company that, that takes utility meter readings. Sounds pretty simple. It, you can walk up to somebody's house and watch the little spinny thing on their house. So is that data particularly private? No, I could sit there all day and write down the numbers on a, on a utility meter. But what this company does is they take the patterns in the usage and they transform those patterns into pattern recognition of what your appliances use in your house. Because they can recognize what a microwave looks like, what a hot water heater looks like, what a shower looks like. All of a sudden you can tell who cooks supper at home. How often do they have a shower? Are they home at all? Is there activity? When do they watch TV? That's a kind of a private, you know, situation right well the data itself wasn't that private you could look at your neighbor's power meter all day they would think you're a weirdo but they, you could do it right it's on the side of your house but all of a sudden you take that raw data and you add some intelligence to it and you create this private data set that's fairly intimate right you can you can 
tell stuff about somebody about that, right? And then the last part of it is where do we, how do we collect it? How does that transmit it? And then where do we store it and is it protected? And I have another slide later in the deck that talks about, you know, the pieces of data and how it flows through all these, all these progressive steps to store and collect and protect. And every one of those steps has its own security profile, right? Everybody with me so far? So, uh, IoT innovation, I'm almost sick of listening to the word IoT, just like cloud, um, because everybody thinks it's the panacea of the next generation of, I guess the next tech bubble or boom or whatever you call it. Um, so lots and lots and lots of people are leveraging data from lots and lots of machines. And, and the next generation of these applications are progressing very, very quickly. And whether that's in a factory, whether it's, you know, from a utility, whether it's from your phone, from location, there is a lot of development going on out there. And, and lots and lots of open source tools. There's lots of kind of application stacks that leverage these things. Most of the leading edge, I would say high performance databases and stacks that, that people use in these developments are open source because they get to market really, really fast. They get mass adoption really, really fast. And a lot of them haven't really been flushed out from the point of view of security yet. So we just have to be really cautious that we're, when we're on the cutting edge, sometimes it's easy to expose things in these data sets that you weren't intending, right? The other one is rapid development. So you can literally go to Microsoft, subscribe to their IoT hub, start sending data from your Raspberry Pi to Microsoft and start creating applications in an hour right? This is really, really quick. It doesn't necessarily mean it's secure. It doesn't mean anything, but all of a sudden you've got an application that gets built really, really quickly. And how many times does that get shown to somebody or the, it forms the basis of a, of a real enterprise application and no one ever goes back and says, man, we just threw that together on a weekend and it's still running. Holy shit. We didn't, we didn't do anything to secure it. Right. Um, we're going to see a lot of consolidation. Um, these tool sets are now becoming more and more um, mainstream, and we're going to see some of the big guys. So you're starting to see micro, that IoT hub didn't exist two years ago. Microsoft's got, I mean, IBM's got a, 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 a IoT hub. Uh, Amazon has an IoT hub. Google has not. Everybody's going to have this because they're trying to be the collector of data, right? There's some great frameworks out there. There's some secure signaling capabilities coming through, but right now it's a little bit of everything, right? If you had to ask 10 people on which protocols are, are going to win the battle, you know, you're going to probably get five or six different answers. I'm not going to beat up developers, but I will a little bit. Uh, generally develop that IOT hub at Microsoft and the guy running the front end application, many, 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 many cases, they never talk to a security guy. That's a web server that gets spun up in Microsoft with an Attachy web server with a back end database, and no one's ever thought about talking to somebody that's used to securing these applications, right? So there's some downside of this rapid development is sometimes the old school, more formalized security practices get missed, right? This is, a, this is a slide that I try to show general industries about this concept of lean, who, knew, who knows about lean startups? Is anybody? Yeah. So, so this whole concept of lean startup is, is about five years old. It's not that old. And, and basically the concept of a lean startup is a company that's formed purely on the idea of validating a, a customer product before they even build it. In other words, this, this idea of having this MVP, minimum viable product that you literally go sell to the customer before you lift a finger to code. And what happens in these environments, it's a very efficient way to find something that's sellable 
And that's why we teach this to entrepreneurs. It's a very efficient way to sell something to a customer because you're getting very quick feedback into your development cycle. The interesting part of this is when you go talk to a customer and you give them something they want um, and, and they're willing to pay for it, you can actually very, very quickly find that your application doesn't match what the customer, that particular customer needs. So you switch customers. And when you switch customers or you switch user groups for your application, you might very well switch the privacy requirements, but you have you never go back and revisit the, the private data, right? So a lot of times we call this a pivot and it happens, depending on the company, it can happen five or six times in the life of a company, right, Ron? Well, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and we've all lived, you know, those of us with gray hair have lived for the, through a few of those. So we have to be very cautious that these companies are built to be agile. They're built to turn on a dime. Every one of those turns can have an impact on the data that we're collecting and the user base that we're talking to, and maybe even the legal requirements for the application. So startups don't think about this, right? Startups are, let's just get this thing out. Let's get money in the door. Let's find users. But you have to keep in mind that the way you use that data may change. Right. Does that make sense to everybody? So anyway, that's my that's my soapbox for startups. Um, so this is kind of what we talk about, right? During this pivot, and it's not really made its way into the pivot model or the lean startup, but you really need to every time you do a pit of it pivot, you really need to think through do have we changed the type of data that we're using? Have we changed our market? Have we changed the privacy impact that we're having on this on this service? And if we do, we've got to really make sure that we take that into account. This is a cool, oh shit, I was gonna bring one of these. Um, so some of the game changers in this space is IoT is extremely fast and extremely cheap to get into, right? So here is a brand, it's not even brand new, this is two years old now, and these, this slide probably could be updated. There's 500 projects, there's probably a thousand projects right now. So here's an example. This embedded Wi-Fi chip has, you know, Wi-Fi built into it as an encryption engine. It has a mesh network, it can build you know, you can imagine if you embedded this chip in almost any data collection device, it goes on a Wi-Fi access point and it will send data back to some mothership somewhere, right? As a 32-bit CPU, great standby power, you can set up a bunch of, you know, general I.O. ports on it. <coughs> Full security, uh, TCP IP, triple uh, network, and there's... Within one year, this chip was actually meant to be a sister chip to, to a larger system. People figured out that it had enough processing power that you could actually program it completely on its own and use it as an IoT device, battery powered or solar powered or you know DC powered. So all of a sudden the community says, I'm gonna start building sensors for this chip. I'm gonna start putting it out really, really quick. Does anybody know how much this thing costs? Take a guess. Three bucks. So you can imagine how many of these things you can spin out for three bucks a piece, right? And it's a very sophisticated, and the really interesting part, it's a Chinese chip, and the really interesting part is the open source community took it upon themselves to translate the whole spec sheet and they put this on GitHub and mm -hmm. all of a sudden the community, the developer community made this thing unbelievably popular when the original manufacturer didn't intend it to be that way at all, right? They just figured it out. They've developed a whole tool chain for it. So that's the kind of thing that you can really see that's gonna impact the, uh, so at three bucks, you can put it anywhere, right? Think about that. Any, 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 uh, do you know of any um, instances, Winston, where it's in use now? 
it's in use all over the place. So you can buy smart light bulbs, smart uh, ah. Wi-Fi switches, smart <clears throat> Wi-Fi AC receptacles, and this chip is embedded in. Right. Cool. Yeah. So here's kind of the the four or five areas that we focus on, and I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the interface points between these these three or four areas in, in the next couple of slides. But this is terrible, but I have to look at the screen to read this uh, slide because I can't see it. And so I'll, I apologize for those of you on the on the video. But so <clears throat> if you look at kind of the three or four areas that we kind of focus on from a use case perspective for, for security is, you know, which what is the interface for the end user, whether that's a cell phone, whether that's a, uh, you know, a voice prompt, whether it's a computer. Um, that's the device that the user interfaces with. And obviously there's security components to how do we secure a cell phone? How do we secure the data when it sits inside of a, a, a disk drive on a, on a tablet, for example, right? And we're actually fairly comfortable and fairly um, well-versed at securing devices in that space because we secure devices that end users talk to or interface with all the time right so securing a, a laptop is something that's well within what we do where where the newness comes is is the devices themselves talking to a gateway and the gateway is quite literally that three dollar device could act as a gateway not that we we might bump it up to a twenty dollar device to act as a gateway and that twenty dollar device collects the data from a hundred three dollar devices and it sends that data to somewhere in a central repository those gateways are op still open source they're still it's a very very busy market everybody's selling these gateways in many cases they're not well protected at the gateway level right so that's probably running an open source stack to some degree um you know it could be your access point at home has many of the same features as this gateway does but you know, people don't secure them that often, right? So we've got to be very cautious that that gateway might be the place that you'd have your first attack. The second one is the communication path between that gateway and the cloud or the central repository. Normally these are cloud-based services. Normally they're traveling through the, the internet. And the interface that cloud collects data on is normally called an API. It's a programming interface that is machine to machine, right? It's, these are not, this is not a web server. It could be a web server, but it's normally a particular protocol that the devices talk. It's not you hitting it with a browser. It's machine to machine. No one necessarily monitors them that close. And all of a sudden, you've got tons and tons and tons of these interfaces that are Internet exposed that we need to make sure that we take, you know, careful attention of when we're, when we're designing these things. And then on top of that cloud is an application which to, to a large degree, we're used to securing applications and we're used to securing databases. And if that's a, some sort of front end where we create dashboards with that data or we make decisions with that data, you know, we're relatively well versed in the industry to protect applications, but the pieces in between are sometimes new and that's where we need to really focus, right? Any questions? All right. So I talked a little bit about APIs. Um, one of the advents of having all of this remote data and having uh, a concept called, does anybody here know what microservices are? Okay, so if you were developers, you would all know this. So, so microservices are a new way of writing code where the components of a particular application actually communicate each other with each other on a machine to machine instead of a building of this big monolithic application where if you do an upgrade, it's a massive, it's a massive upgrade. An AP, a microservice means you build your code in modules and those modules could be in different machines in different locations in different clouds. And those modules actually talk to each other in a machine to machine level. That communication path, the end point of that communication path is called an API, right? So it's usually in an XML type format document. And these APIs are what allow these new 
developer methodologies to really be very fast getting applications out in the market. It also means that you can re replace one of your modules or upgrade one of your modules without changing the rest of your application. So it's, it's a very powerful way to build applications. The challenge with that is every one of these APIs are a vector for attack, right? So every single component to that needs to be somewhere that's safe and secure. Interestingly enough, these web facing APIs, these are these APIs that I have on this graph are internet accessible APIs, which in 2008, I think there was like 10 of them. Now there's 20,000 of them. And these are machine level, never for human consumption, internet facing APIs. And if that API is not secured, you can get access to some pretty significant information, right? So there's a huge growth in APIs and a lot of it is driven by the IoT business. We're sending massive amounts of data out through all kinds of different methodologies to these APIs. So it's a big deal. It changes the way we have to think about how we secure environments, right? Yeah, I got a new email. Any questions on that? Does anybody have questions on APIs or security? So these, uh, these, these APIs, like only the developer can uh, secure this? Like the user cannot in any way have access and change it? Generally, there's no human interaction with that API. Um, but no, so the the normally what you do in an API is the the type of traffic that goes through an API is generally very predictable. If you think about it, right? The data that comes from a sensor is generally always in the same format. One variable may change, but the, the type of data coming to an API is very, very um, predictable. So normally what you would do to secure something like an API is put some sort of intrusion prevention system in place to say, if I see anything outside the norm of that piece of traffic, we've probably got an issue, right? And then the second part of it is, is denial of service, right? So we've seen APIs where they'll have masses of amounts of traffic thrown at them. And this is where my, the, the benefit of using a Microsoft for uh, IoT Hub is they deal with this every day. They know how to subvert you know, DDoS attacks much better than a, you know, a small development team with their own web server, right? So there's some benefit of using some of these big services and they can handle these massive amounts of data and these massive denial of service attacks. But so to answer your question, the developer may be the only one that has access to how you program the API. The infrastructure around the API can be secured. Winston, Lisa here. Uh, I just have a question regarding the stats. Um, they go back to 2008. Just curious where you got those from. Uh, um, programmableweb.com. Thank you. There was one other question as well from William uh, Winston. He was asking um, uh, if, it's, if you're able to speak to a case where uh, organizations, older technologies upgraded to IoT type, um, type services with uh, usual loss of security. <coughs> That's exactly what I was just going to say. So, uh, does everybody know what SCADA is? <coughs> okay, so, um, so SCADA is a superv supervisory protocol for um, many utilities, whether it's your water system, your gas system, or your electricity system. SCADA is the protocol that turns things on and off. So, if you have a power outage in a particular area, the SCADA system will actually say reroute the power through another distribution network to get your power back on. As you can imagine, it's probably a network you don't want people messing around with. Well, those protocols and those, we call them RTUs, the remote terminal units that, that listen for these instructions, many, many times they're 20, 30 years old with very old TCP IP stacks and it's generally fairly simple the second you get access to that network to make those things do things that 
they're not supposed to do. So that's a, and, and SCADA, the new SCADA systems, guess what? They have APIs because SCADA is getting smarter and smarter on the edge to do things like outage management detection, right? So if there's an outage in two or three particular areas in a, in a power company, the SCADA system will signal back to the central office to say, I just had an outage in this particular area, in this particular area, both of those feed back to the same main line. We better dispatch a truck to that main line location, right? So it's very valuable service. And, and to be honest, they've replaced all the people that knew how to do that and it's automated, right? So the SCADA system builds APIs. The second you get through that API to the old school RTUs, it's a really bad day, right? And some of us in this room may have even knocked some of those out when we're scanning them for vulnerabilities, not on purpose. I'm not going to name any. Yeah, they're touchy, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> does that make sense? Does that, does that answer your question? I think it I does find, for me, I, for sure. Sorry, yeah, I find it funny. I find it funny because, you know, you see all these massive IOT numbers. There's been a lot of con really dumb connected devices for an awfully long time. They get lumped in or smart meters, you know, there's gazillions of them out there. Right. So they all get called IOT. Right. Okay. Uh, this is the typical top 10 uh, things, and of course, you can't do a security presentation without a top 10 and a picture of a cat, although I don't, I don't have a picture of a cat tonight. I don't know what it is with cats, but anyway. Um, so the top 10, I mean, insecure web, so, you know, it's not really an IoT, just an IoT problem, but, you know, you got your your video cameras at home or your baby monitors or your you know, your wireless access points, whatever's connected to the internet, your, your fridge, your coffee maker, and no one's changed the password on the interface. I mean, that's just the stupidest, but the best example. Now, the, another really important piece here is those, the internet scanned for those devices completely all the time. I mean, I don't know if people saw the, the, uh, the camera footage for the school in Cape Britain. I'm sure you guys have seen it, right? Where somebody from Russia, has a listing of all the open security cameras. One of them happens to be outside a school washroom in Cape Britain, completely on the internet, completely with a default password, right? Kind of bad press for that school board, right? So the other thing is, of course, those devices typically get compromised and they typically get some sort of software stack turned on them to create them as an attacker on these massive denial of service attacks. Somebody wakes them all up and says, attack this IP address really difficult to stop because they're coming from all over the world and now all of a sudden your baby camera is attacking you know the cia website right it's kind of bad uh insufficient authentication authorization again you know basic user id and password can be broken relatively quick but another really interesting thing is these cheap 20 dollars devices or the three dollar devices um normally don't limit your password tries either right so you could sit there if you've got all the time in the world in your hands even if it does have a password nothing stops you from continuing to just hit that thing over and over and over again where more sophisticated servers or you know more sophisticated devices will do a timeout and they'll limit the amount of password tries they'll lock out your account most of the iot devices won't do that because it takes resources and Probably took an extra couple beers and an extra pizza that weekend. Uh, thanks. Uh, insecure network services, again, back to, you know, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be putting firewalls and intrusion prevention in front of some of these applications. Uh, but if the IoT device is in the field, by default, it's probably somewhere that you don't want to spend a huge amount of money, right? If I'm the utility and I have to set every single house up for reading their meter, you know, an extra $20 per house adds up really, really fast. So you're very limited in the amount of resources you can put in the field. So it's hard to protect, protect those devices like you would in a major data center. Right? Privacy concerns, we talked a lot about that, right? So these, these devices do collect a lot of data. Insecure cloud interface, that's that API on the cloud side of the collection device. Insecure mobile interface, again, you know, if I have 
you know, I have my door lock on my Wi-Fi network and I get a hold of this lap of this phone and it, the password is saved on my phone. It's pretty easy to open up my garage door and my, um, you know, unlock my home door. Insufficient security configura configurability. Well, again, a lot of these things don't have a huge amount of features in them to, you know, add things like password lockouts and, and the like, right? Software, firmware, there's, you know, they're buggy. And then poor physical security. So uh, we have a local conference here called Atlantic Security, Altset Kong. Last year, we had a guy, it, it, the, the guy, this, the B side, the guy that does the side power, uh, he's from Dow. He spoke last year. Anyway, he's got a piece of software that basically analyzes the power utilization of a device and it hits it with passwords and it can tell how much power the device uses by how close you are in the password. And you can crack the password in like three minutes. And you're like, why the hell did I even bother, right? So if you get physical access to that device, you can start cracking that particular, and most devices, by the way, have an administrative type of password that's only for the manufacturer. And if you can crack that, you can get into any of them, right? So. Any questions? So should I go home and unplug my? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put your uh, find out where the where the traffic's going, brother. Well, it's certainly interesting, isn't it? Because you know this year has seen the proliferation of you know uh, Google Mini and Alexa and uh, Echo and all the uh, home security devices yeah. that go along with that. And uh, well, we did a we did a. We did an internal scan. I shouldn't tell this story, but I will. Uh, we did an internal scan as part of our normal stuff. And so this morning I'm sitting with the team and uh, not bad results, but our Apple TV with a Bluetooth interface in one of our conference rooms came back with the Bluetooth um, vulnerability. The thing is sitting right beside the parking lot of the, of the, uh, of the building, right? And I'm going, oh, Jesus, like you just... Because blue the Apple TV just advertises itself constantly, right? And you go, oh man, I never thought about that. Just made it work for myself, but you know that's the kind of thing you miss, and that's a typical IoT. We've got big firewalls with intrusion prevention and lots of web security on the front end, and somebody can drive right beside the building and oh, there's an Apple TV. I wonder what version has it been patched? Nope. Oh, I can connect with Bluetooth now. I've got an internal IP address. Let's see what's going on here, right? So. My office is, I'm not going to tell you where my office is. <laughs> um, so here's the thing that we've seen in the last couple of years. And again, those of us in the business, everybody in the public realizes that the security, the reason you guys are probably taking the classes you are is because the visibility for security and the demand for resources is going through the roof. Part, most of it is due to the fact that security now, security incident security hacking is a business right it's in the, and we've only seen this in the past few years i'm going to say five years um so other than i shouldn't say that it's always been a business for government states but most of the time it was not that profitable for general consumer hacking and now it's a business there's there's you know a revenue stream there's companies set up there's whole blocks set up to do hacking and they hire people and they do this and there's a really great ROI for passwords and accounts and so we see that this business is growing and it drives a huge amount of of response and there's that cat and mouse game between how much do you invest to protect something worth versus how much that data is worth to somebody right so you know that's driving a lot of this you know, there's a lot of this conversation, a lot of the volume of, of cyber attacks, right? So, you know, balanced approach, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna do IoT. It means figure out where you need to spend your time and effort. Um, know what context you're gonna need to use in developing one of these applications or implementing one of these applications and make sure you're using the right amount of data in the right places.
don't collect things you don't need. It's just a liability. And if you collect data that's private, all of a sudden you've got yourself in a situation where you've got to spend extra time and extra money. If you don't need the data, you probably shouldn't be collecting. You know, leverage technology, um, there's a lot of great tools out there. Um, many, many cases, there's way better tools today. And, and some of these tools like cloud, for example, it's a double-edged sword. Cloud gives us a lot of capabilities to do um, manage your security environments and do testing and and restore environments if they're ever compromised. I mean, we have a lot of flexibility or fingertips, but it also creates lots of easy ways to implement technology that isn't secure. So, you know, the 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 days of setting up a, a data center and servers and kind of the procurement was the regulator of security to some degree. You had to talk to the IT department, which had to put a server in place, which automatically means that security was thought through. Now it's your developer pulls out his credit card and puts a server on Amazon, completely bypasses the old school, you know, security that we would have normally seen as a, as a practice, right? So leverage technology, but just be aware that, you know, things are easier leaking through And know your data. So, you know, the end of the day, uh, and I, th I think I've said this about 12 times now, but really keep in mind of the data that you need to run your business and to develop your application and uh, know where that data kind of crosses the line between privacy and, and security, right? And if, it, and if there are sensitive components to that data, make sure you understand how you need to protect it. And that's probably it. Yeah. So any questions? Yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, <clears throat> you can, um, you're, you're on, everybody's on mute right now, but if you if you raise your hand, there's a column beside your name there and you can click raise your hand or you can just type in a question there too and I can just unmute you. Um, thought that might be better than just unmuting everybody all at the same time, that could be disastrous. So, so uh, <laughs> yeah, but if anybody does wanna ask any questions and feel free. So, uh, Winston, your thoughts on how law enforcement could leverage IoT? Oh, that's a good question. You can collect a lot of data with IoT. So I think that, you know, there's lots of opportunities to <clears throat> provide, uh, I won't say surveillance, but, you know, there's lots of opportunities to collect data in much cheaper ways than it used to be, right? So if it's, you know, I mean, the old days it's video, but quite literally today, you know, with cloud and IoT and the and the software in the background, and I'm sure you guys have run into like facial recognition. You can write a facial recognition program with the facial APIs with Microsoft in a weekend, right? That can sit here and recognize everybody that comes through the door based on their Facebook picture, right? It's, these things are so prevalent now that yeah, I think it opens up a lot more opportunities, right? It's something that you wouldn't have even thought about five or 10 years ago. And it's done with your $100 webcam. <laughs> Winston, in the public sphere, um, so municipalities, healthcare, higher education, um, the use of sensors and sensor data is there and, and the proliferation of those those devices do you get a sense that the greater community on a global scale is talking about how to classify certain devices i.e passive passive active um, we have a, and the types of protocols so for instance you talk about home gateways yeah um, home gateways have been around now for probably 10 years or so yeah. in, in the commercial sense. You know, yeah. we've got Rogers, Bell, and others using it for home security as an example, but healthcare is involved as well, using leveraging. Um, you've got, you know, you, you could be using RFID, you could have Bluetooth, you could have Zigbee, whatever it is. Um, they're all points of, of, of weakness, I guess, potentially, yep. right? Um, do you get a sense in your business day to day that there's some active work, whether it's within law enforcement as the push or within government as the oversight to say, you know, we need to really 
uh, to get a, get a handle on how we classify the use of these devices. Well, actually, if you back up one more step, just classifying the data would be fantastic. We don't have a lot of that activity going on. But, that, but that's subjective somewhere yeah. too, right? Because yeah. you've got overlaid data sources that right. could, as you said, con contextualize the way it's... So doing. so that's the point, right? It is, is if it doesn't fall within some level of classification in the organization, you need to know how to treat this data. And then the next part of it, which bucket which classification bucket does this data fall in, right? So most- What's collecting the data? Right, yeah. and what data is it? What does yeah. it identify, right? So if it's, a, if it's a salt truck, and it's how much salt goes down on the road, and it gets leaked to the press, probably not a terribly damaging thing, right? It's not private data, other than the salt truck driver was sitting at Tim Hortons for 45 minutes longer than it's supposed to, right? But, you know, we have, there's a ton and ton of this data that is not seen as privacy related data, right? It's it's just data, right? Doesn't mean there can't be bad things done with it, right? Back to the, you know, your home security, you know, your home security system is on a Zigbee or a Z-Wave network and there's known vulnerabilities yeah. in that. And if somebody wants to go through the effort, but my experience, it's easier to send you an email to get you to open up that subverts your computer to an attack. You don't have to go anywhere and you're going to get attacked from China rather than somebody driving in your driveway and trying to hack a Zigbee network. It's just a, you know, it's just a level of effort that needs to go behind these things, right? So obscurity sometimes is not a bad, not a bad thing. But the those protocols, there is no winner. They're all over the map. And those interfaces are all, it's a land grab, right? So if you're Google and Nest, you want everything on the Nest network because you want to control oh, the data. Sure. Yeah. If you're the utility, Nest scares the crap out of them because all of a sudden Google has all the customer data rather than the utility, right? So there's, there's these land grabs going on in different industries. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, yeah. And I'd like, uh, yeah. go ahead, Lisa. No, I was just going to say, uh, with regards to the data, I, I liked the point that you made about data classification and the importance of that. Uh, but the other thing as well, only 4% of data is breached where it where it's, isn't encrypted. So if you encrypt the data at rest and in transit, then you eliminate the, you know, the risk of data being breached in the first place. Right. And the obscurity of the data, like if you, if you happen to if you're a, if if it's this is an enterprise application and you happen to break the network at the salt truck and you see that data, it's pretty meaningless and you know it's the data gets more and more valuable as it gets analyzed, right? So that's the challenge is at what point it there may be no encryption at the salt truck, but the second it gets to the gateway or the second it gets to the database level, it's encrypted and it makes it very difficult to do anything with or make any sense of it, right? So, you know, it, yeah. it's the way you process the data is probably as important. I mean, a single piece of data on itself is is uh, probably pretty innocent, but when you take that data and combine it with other information, just like you would with data elements of a, a private or a personal identifiable information, then that's when it can be used in some way that might be nefarious of some sort. You got it. Okay, so back up on the data for a second and take access to the device as an attack factor, and mm -hmm. that's a very different story. Right? right. Yeah, especially if that device is not, if it's not well, if there's no gateways in place yeah. that can stop the data right up the chain. Okay. So we're talking a lot about data sets and how vulnerable these IoT devices are. I'm honestly teaching how a lot easier to hack things than to protect it. And these IoT devices are going to be more and more popular. How are we supposed to protect a attacker who can get hacked into your Google Home, start listening to that microphone, get more, more data where you live, what kind of devices you have, and then go on from there. So, how are we supposed to protect against that when there's so much more hackers than, you know, heroes? That's the classic age-old question, right? It's the cat and mouse. Welcome to the war. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Most of the time, I'd say it's because you're not interesting enough in there. You know, why would they bother, right? 
So, you know, it's the old age old, you just need to be a little bit tougher to get than the other guy that's out there. And, you know, don't put your stuff on the internet without any security because, you know, that's what they're going to, they're going to go after the easy stuff, right? I'll tell you if 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 an actor wanted to wanted to, uh, I mean, we're we're in a world that if somebody wants to get your data, and you're the target of a of a very targeted attack, it's pretty tough. You're in a you're in, you're probably at a disadvantage. Right? Someone like you and Ron, I can imagine a lot of people would want to get. Well, I'm, I have a very boring, I have a very boring life, so yeah, yeah. But okay. but you know the 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 point is is there are there are organized crime, you know, activities out there that if if it's a real thing, espionage and stealing trade secrets, it happens every day, and those ta attacks they'll try everything, right? You've got you've got a team of very skilled people sending very specific emails to very specific users that look really real and nine times out of ten those users click on it right and they're they don't have to attack anything it's just it's an easy way to get it. my greater concern with iot is not the nefarious bad actors i'm more concerned with, and we've seen this so many times before with every advent of convenient technology where it is deployed willy-nilly in the most dangerous possible fashion. I mean, you know, we, we know that we can hack cars, we know that we can hack airplanes, we know that we can hack your coffee maker, right? Uh, industry is deploying, you know, these special purpose IoT devices in what is ultimately critical situations without, you know, any pre existing security designs into the system, simply doing it because they can do it and creating vulnerabilities and creating unsafe environments for everybody and these are not russian hackers these are you know government utilities and car manufacturers and plane manufacturers is there a industry standard best practice guide to like do these 10 things if you're a startup these are the 10 things you need to cover well there's so there's yeah there's frameworks depending on the industry you're in and then back to the there's you know there's nist which is an industry standard list. Um, there are programs. There are lots of methodologies out there you can use as a template. But they're, but they're generic. They don't necessarily apply to everything, but right. certainly, and get people that have done it before, right? I mean, that's the other thing is we've done a lot of stupid stuff, so we know not what to do, right? And we've seen lots of stuff. And, you know, that's where you really, you have to kind of, you're balancing risk. Right, you'll never be 100% risk free. It's like, okay, given all these variables, spend your money on these one or two things that are going to give you your best benefit. Right? Hi, so we have, uh, or I have a couple questions here in Fredericton, and maybe others do as well. Um, I'm with Service New Brunswick trying to work out a policy for how we can deal with what is likely to be a flood of IoT related requests over time. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of thinking about where is it, you mentioned that things will eventually converge. Where is it that you look for that convergence to the point where you, you see when a good standard emerges and a good best practice? Would you just keep keep an eye on the NIST website, keep an eye on CIS, or is there something specific to IoT that you would look for? That's one question. And, and as well for any large organizations, do you have any examples of people actually doing this correctly? <laughs> Well, there's lots of examples of of sophisticated IoT. I mean, we do work with GE on jet engines. Okay. And and we do these back office in plane communication systems that optimize the jet fuel use and the engine and the speed and all those things. Okay, that, so sorry. I, I, I don't what I what I what I mean by doing things correctly is dealing with the level of people wanting IoT devices in the organizations. Say, like, I'm, I'm a security professional who gets requested to, uh, I'll get a piece of software or a device 
and they'll say, we haven't security reviewed this. Could you please security review it and tell us if it's okay? And yeah. uh, what I'm looking for is dealing with what's likely to be a uh, flood of those type of requests. And I anticipate that other governments, maybe other large organizations have faced that problem before. But do you know of any um, organizations yeah. that have dealt with yeah, it <laughs> Yeah, I, I would actually back up one more step. I would, uh, there may be nothing you need to do. So. Normally, in, in the business, we would look at something like that and, and do more of a threat risk assessment, right? In the balance of things that can happen to your business, does this IoT data really matter that much, right? So, and in a, in a threat risk assessment, you can kind of balance the probability versus the consequences, right? So, if you have a really high probability that that salt truck can get compromised, but the worst thing that can happen is they send bad data. That's all that can happen. They can only send weird numbers to the gateway. So you scrub that data. Does it really have a big impact on your overall risk? No. So don't spend time trying to secure salt trucks, right? The next level would be what happens if they get access to the database? Well, what would they need to get access to? So it's it's more of a it's more of a holistic view of, and by the way, in the scheme of things, there are maybe more important places to spend your time and energy in your overall security program than this, right? So it's different if you're GE and if that jet engine stops, bad things are going to happen, then you've got to spend that time. But it, so in the in a in an operation like a government, there may be there may you just need to take that in context of all the other things you need to do, right? And then the second part of so threat risk assessment's a really good place to start. And then the privacy impact assessment, yeah, I'm sure you go through these every day, right? Privacy impact assessment says, if I'm rolling out a new IoT program, is there any individual data, citizen data in there that I need to be worried about from a regulatory point of view? And you can, relative, you can usually answer that relatively quick. And if those two things are low in the importance, then I wouldn't spend a heck of a lot more time on it. Okay. Winston, just a, a question regarding uh, the TRA frameworks uh, for IoT devices. There's so many different threat risk assessment frameworks out there. Is there one particular uh, one that you would recommend for doing uh, risk assessments for IoT devices? Nope. No, I think they all work. So the, the IoT is no different than any other system that you'd have in place, right? So you would you would identify. I mean, there may be. There may be different questions you ask as part of that framework, but you know every TRA I've ever been involved is a real at the output of that TRA is a fairly simple table, right? You've got your kind of your your probabilities of the threat, and then you've got your impacts of the threat, and you and you have high, low, medium, whatever you classify it, one to ten. But the indicators of those could be different, right? Like what do you need to evaluate to determine if it's a threat or not? Right. Uh, most of these frameworks are relatively the right? They're pretty similar across the, the board, but I just I just wondered if you had used one over, you know, another framework. That's all. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you'd you'd probably involve technical people that could make qualified assumptions. The only place I've seen that is if you're applying for cyber insurance as an example. And they may recommend make a recommendation that says yeah. this is what you need to use as your yeah, yeah, they might have a tool that they use. Yeah, there may be industry specific things for sure. Was that Peter saying that? Sorry, no. I don't know. Talking about the cyber insurance requirements. Sean. Sean. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, it was just a little hard to hear through the audio. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, and there, back to the cyber insure security insurance. There may be, depending on the industry you're in, you may have very, very specific. Yeah. Like the federal government has a very specific TRA framework that they follow, but it, the output of that is not much different than any other framework, right? Perfect. Other, other question for you, then, Winston. I'm always kind of fascinated by the human interface side of IoT. So I'm reading this thing today a Tulsa driver. Ran into the back of a fire truck in broad daylight, uh, attending another freeway accident. Doesn't look like the driver ever touched the brakes at all. The hood of the car was back on top of the windshield practically. The 
crumpled up that bed, and he's trying to blame the autopilot from the Telsa manufacturer because it didn't stop him in time. How yeah. do we train people not to be dumb users of IoT? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I rented a, I had a, I had a Tesla out in the spring and we were in Vegas going down the strip and I wanted to turn on the, my wife would not let me turn on the autopilot. Oh, wow on the Vegas Strip, which for some reason she thought that was a bad idea. I'm thinking nothing random ever happens on the Vegas Strip. <laughs> There's another one though, to, to, to counter that, I don't know if you guys have watched this YouTube video, but it was a Tesla with the radar function. The car put the brakes on, the guy was driving it, he was literally in control, but the car had the collision sensor and the radar was bouncing underneath the car in front of him in, the, in two cars ahead. And those two cars were actually coming too close to each other. And this guy literally 10 seconds before he even saw anything happening, the car backed off and then the two cars in front of him crashed. <laughs> and you're thinking, how would you ever know that without having a sensor like that? Anyway. One of the things that, that struck me about that chip, and I'm going to run over to Gentronics now and buy a bag of them. Yeah. Um, they should be putting those in one of the kits. Um, Surveillance possibilities are yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, you put them everywhere. You, you have a fully powered, you know, wireless <coughs> device that you could, as an ex employee of mine tried to do, fire on top of a building with a potato gun. Yeah. Right. You, <laughs> could. Just, you can deploy those things all over the place. Right? Yeah. yeah. And you would never notice. That and that particular chip will go to sleep. So it'll literally go to sleep very very low power yes. so you could put a battery on that thing and it would wake up you could program it to wake up certain times and send stuff and uh, you can just scatter that yeah just scatter the yep. yep. think for a nice botnet <clears throat> yeah yes yeah you build your own botnet for 50 bucks yeah. <laughs> do we have any other questions online Looks like we're doing pretty good, Al. Yes, for sure. Worst time I've ever been ahead of time. It's good. Typically, what always happens is the best discussion is after the conference is over. So uh, <laughs> if anybody has any ideas now. You guys have the, I, I can send you the slides. You guys feel free to peruse and um, and any questions, just reach out, emails. I think Tony uh, also said that this is being recorded, so it would be available. Um, I guess uh, I was thinking as you were talking here, what we're starting to see this Christmas is a lot of uh, $9 smartwatches coming from China, $20 smartwatches and yep. in the work environment and what risk that presents. It's it's, uh, it's a little Android on your arm. Yeah. Well, remember too that all of the legislation that covers the collection of healthcare data, right, of, of health information about you, only covers the uh, healthcare industry from the perspective of providers, of recognized providers. So all of those Garmin's and Fitbit's and all that sort of stuff that is gathering healthcare data about you, they are free to do with that data whatever they please. It is not covered by any legislation. So you yeah, the same. The all. same goes for those DNA um, um, data that people are submitting as well. Yeah, that's right, because the legislation is based on, on the providers, not on the technology. Yeah. That's insane. I've been wearing these things for weeks and I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. they're selling. <laughs>